Welcome to Students Over Systems, a podcast that celebrates education freedom. I'm your host, Jenny Gentles. At Students Over Systems, we talk with the creators, advocates, and beneficiaries of education freedom. On today's year in review, naughty and nice list episode, we're going to review the bad and the good, the naughty and nice, and education freedom news from 2023. For this important discussion, we're joined by Nicole Solis, IWF Education Freedom Center Senior Fellow, Bane of Teachers Unions, Relentless Education Transparency Advocate, and Twitter Warrior Extraordinaire. Nicole, thank you so much for joining us. Hi, Jenny. Thank you for having me. Okay, Nicole, this is different for me. Normally, I interview a guest and I get to sit back, ask a few questions, and let them talk. But we're going to try to have a conversation here as we talk through the Education Freedom Center's 2023 Naughty and Nice list. But before we do that, can you tell us a little bit about your story and why you are the bane of teachers unions everywhere? I would love to. Well, two years ago, I enrolled my daughter in kindergarten and I wanted to know what my school was teaching related to critical race theory and gender theory. And when I asked, my school told me to submit public records requests. It was the only way that I could get my answers. And so I submitted hundreds of requests because I had hundreds of questions after I learned that my school district did teach gender ideology. They didn't call kids boys and girls, and they would teach a certain line of thinking about American history, but they wouldn't tell me what that was exactly. And then my school district threatened to sue me in a public meeting. They had a show trial for me with hundreds of people. They decided not to sue me. And then the teachers union sued me. So this was two years ago, suing me for literally asking questions about what they're teaching in public school. Um, And we are now currently in discovery with the teachers union. And um, we'll have an update on that soon um, with my lawyers at the Goldwater Institute because we finally saw all of the dirty tricks the union was pulling um, when they decided to sue me for doing absolutely nothing wrong, but being a good parent and asking questions. Nicole, I'd imagine you were a huge surprise both to the school district and to the unions because the tactics that you've described would generally silence somebody. A person would not want to be uh, called out like you were at at these public meetings that, that the school board was was having and certainly wouldn't want to be sued. How do you persevere through that? I didn't have a choice. I mean, they had, my, you know, first my school district had this huge meeting where they called me racist. They called another organization racist for also submitting public records complaints. They also sued my husband, the teachers union, and they only sued him because he was my husband who also submitted public records requests. And so my choice was let my school district and teachers union ostracize me from my community. Um, You know, like, like I'm some kind of social pariah when really I'm, I'm the opposite. I'm a very social, happy person. And want to be involved in my community. And so I said, well, I'm either going to let them destroy me and my family's reputation or I'm going to fight back. So in my case, it was so extreme. I I really didn't have a choice. I think other parents maybe go through um, things with their school district where it's like, oh, let's just handle this quietly so that way we can protect our son. But here they just threw me in the public arena and gave me no choice but you know to fight back publicly. So I uh, kind of feel like you know, my situation was a little different than like the the average parent who has a conflict in public school. I had like, I mean, it was like a Salem witch trial. I, I just can't explain how extraordinary it was to go through that in the moment. Mm, just read the crucible over the weekend. So <laughs> I know yeah. what you mean. <laughs> really connect with that, that play now. <laughs> All right, so let me kick off our naughty list first. We'll get to the nice and then also talk a little bit about what we hope to have happened in 2023. But let's dwell in the negative and the naughty first. And uh, let's stay with teachers unions. I would like to put first on the list, on the naughty list, the teachers unions that closed schools once again in 2023 by launching strikes. And I'm just going to talk about the unions that closed schools just in the last few months, just this fall. The students in Youngstown, Ohio missed the first month of school because of a teacher strike. You're talking about heartbreaking proficiency rates. So these are students who could not afford to lose more school days. There were also students in two school districts in Washington state that missed a week or more of school due to strikes at the beginning of the year, which is a very destabilizing way to start the school year. And then most recently, there was no school November in Portland, Oregon. 
the Portland Association of Teachers decided to go on strike. They had tailgates. They had dance parties. They blocked a bridge because that's, I guess, a progressive thing to do now to block traffic on a bridge. Oh, my God. And, uh, and they kept school kids out of school in November. When the district finally settled with the unions, they scheduled makeup instructional days, including uh, days that cut into what was previously the winter break. And 30% of the teachers have uh, called in absent or sick. Um, their teachers union leader instructed them to, or encouraged them to do that, but just don't post anything on social media indicating that you're not sick, please and thank you. She literally said that. So that's number one on the list, Nicole. Teachers unions that close schools once again by launching strikes. I'd imagine you have some things to add to the list. Yeah, well, you know, now that, you know, I, I knew about some of them. I didn't know about all of them when I was, you know, doing my own year in review research. I, I realized just like how much that goes on that I really don't know happened just like in the past few months. You really have to just like Google things like, like things that you don't think are actually happening and they they are actually happening. It's kind of a fun experiment to be like, did a school district really do this? And they, and they did. And a lot of this started with, of course, Randy Weingarten closing down schools. I suspect that everything you just said with teachers unions closing down schools, they were, they were really kind of empowered by what happened during COVID where they, they, they could just work with the CDC and say, this is what we want to happen during COVID. And the, you know, the CDC will actually take them up on their advice and give them what they want. Now, as if we all don't remember that happened, Randy Weingarten, of course, this year testified that none of that happened, that she was actually always pushing for schools to be open. And of course you can go onto her famous tweet on Twitter and see that she was slammed with a community note posting article after article of Randy Weingarten saying that they absolutely do not want schools open unless they get a whole, you know, riot act of everything that, that they wanted. Um, and you can even track, you know, cause Randy Weingarten of American Federation for Teachers, she'll, she'll say that, that that never happened or you're misrepresenting me, but you can track how schools that had bigger union influence, they stayed closed for longer. Gee, that's that's not just a correlation without causation. Randy was quoted in 2020 as saying that opening school districts was reckless, callous, and cruel. Um, and uh, you know, I, I think going back to again the the CDC emails that we uncovered, I don't think any of us thought that Randy Weingarten, or at least I didn't. Maybe I'm naive. Had a direct line to the Center for Disease Control in those emails. I think I always perceived it as like, wow, you know, she can just, she has such a big platform that maybe the message will get to the people in power that are making these decisions when, when really they were just having like COVID pillow talk the whole time. And that was really shocking. Yeah, not just emails, but also phone calls as well. And Randy wasn't alone in union leadership uh, that has done wrong by students. Betty, Becky Pringle from the NEA, the National Education Association, kind of gets away with stuff because Randy is such a super villain. So I'd imagine you're keeping an eye on the NEA as well. Yeah, yeah. Becky Pringle, she's more sly, although you can find there's this amazing video I saw of how, uh, I mean, she may be quieter on social media and in the news, but I, I think she is way more radical and, and extreme when you see her um, at her NEA uh, conferences, her yearly conferences. I mean, it looks like a cult sermon. It's, it's incredible the way that she really just sermonizes at all of her union members. And it's uh, a little scarier that we have less information on her compared to Randy Weingarten. Mm -hmm. um, Speaking of union conferences, we had the American Federation of Teacher Conference in 2023 that coached teachers to hide gender identity and gender transitions from parents. So people will say this isn't happening in schools. And of course, there are teachers that aren't doing this, but they had their whole yearly conference in 2023 actually telling teachers to do this. And we have lawsuits that have emerged that are suing school districts. Thank God we have some good teachers that are suing school districts saying that they're not going to lie to parents about this, you know, real, again, a cult, this gender cult. Um, but it's the teachers union, both the NEA and the American Federation of Teachers that are behind pushing this gender ideology. 
Well, we did a series of blog posts covering the summer meetings, both the NEA and the AFT's summer meetings. And so I encourage listeners to check those out. We'll try to put them in show notes somewhere. Um, And it exposed just what their priorities were. And surprise, surprise, it was ideology and not academics. Um, The other thing that Randy Weingarten did that, again, was mind blowing. I don't know who she's actually fooling. Um, She recently attributed the rise in homeschooling to a rise in needs for kids in special education. And of course, again, she was slapped with a community note and all of these replies saying, actually, I think it's because of all the ideology that you're pushing in public school that parents, both Democrats and Republican, conservatives, liberals, don't really want this being pushed on their kids. And without a school choice um, legislation regime in your state, you really have no other choice but to homeschool your kid. Unbelievable that she brings special needs kids into this when closing schools was absolutely cruel and devastating to those vulnerable kids. They were denied services. They were denied accommodations. They didn't just have the learning loss that uh, that other kids had. They had, you know, devastating backslides and, and just even able to like physically manage themselves um, and cruel to the parents too, that they were denied those services uh, for their, for their children. Yeah. Um, oh, sorry. Go ahead. I'm just going to say, I I don't think that Randy and Becky really think about the kids. And that's something that we try to make clear here. We're talking about a union, which prioritizes the needs of adults. And these are adults in in a system. So this is about power and influence and jobs, not students and academics. And I I don't know how to make that clearer in 2024, but we're certainly going to try that we are for classroom teachers, that second grade, warm, loving classroom teacher. We love her. The unions that are about amassing wealth that they then pass along to elect legislators and politicians who will do their bidding, we're not so much for them. (laughs) We're against them. (laughs) Right. Well, I think a lot of teachers that are in the union are not even aware of their radical propaganda. I recently went to um, Colorado for a conference with an organization called Freedom Foundation, and it was a a two, three day conference educating teachers about what their unions are doing with their money. Um, So the whole point is to get teachers to leave the union, because thanks to the Janus decision, you can either stay in your union and not pay them and they still have to collectively bargain for you, or you can leave them and you can go to professional associations that give you the same protections as a union for less money and no radical politics and propaganda. Um, So they've done, the unions have done a very good job of equating unions with, um, you know, that second grade teacher that that you've always loved since you were, um, you know, seven years old, but they're really entirely different things. Yeah. So we're going to keep making that clear. And another way to do that would be to continue the naughty list and get a little, a uh, little more local with unions on our, on our naughty list. Of course, the national unions, the NEA and the AFT and their leaders, uh, Randy Weingarten and Becky Pringle are on the naughty list. Uh, but the Independent Women's Forum Education Freedom Center launched a weekly teachers union report card earlier this year. We've done 11 and our goal was to expose some of these state and local unions and what they're up to. Randy's not the only supervillain, as I mentioned. So one of the unions that uh, that we profiled in our in our teachers union report card was the Maryland State Education Association. It was exposed recently that their travel expenditures averaged $53,736 per month over the last decade. And in years like 2016, they spent $1.1 million on travel. And that doesn't count conferences and conventions and meetings. So I don't know what they're doing (laughs) or where they're going. But uh, it continued even while they had schools closed during COVID. So they're spending hundreds of thousands of dollars during the COVID years, even as most schools in Maryland were shut down for prolonged periods. Um, So that's one union that we wanted to keep on the on the union list. This is a, a a union that pays 11 employees more than $200,000 a year 
last year. These are well compensated individuals who are also well traveled. So good for them, not good for <laughs> students. And uh, the the Maryland Teachers Union is definitely on the naughty list. Wait, uh, what were they supposed to be afraid of traveling during COVID? Like, wasn't getting on an airplane supposed to be a death sentence? And they could have died. They could have died. <laughs> <laughs> how dare we? How dare we talk about opening schools? Clearly, we wanted teachers dead. Oh, wait, they're still traveling, uh, which was something that happened. I think it was the Chicago's Teachers Union where they were they were tweeting about how this was uh, this was racist and and sexist and all all the above uh, to to call for opening schools. But they were like also on vacation in uh, yeah Bikari. yeah it was misogynist to open schools. I I mean I myself as a woman thought oh if you open this school that means you hate me. I mean I I still can't get over that tweet. That I don't I have no idea what the heck they were talking about. Yeah, it, it, well, it, it's absolutely insane when you think about like women like me had to stop working in 2020 to oversee my children's education because schools oh. were closed for so long. I had kids with special needs. I had to prioritize those. And so I lost income and uh, and lost the fun of working with uh, organizations like Independent Women's uh, Forum. And um, yeah, I kind of feel like the closing schools was kind of misogynist. It wasn't very good to, to mothers uh, who had to had to pause what they were doing um, uh, and educate their child at home, which when it wasn't planned. Okay, so a little bit more on the Chicago teachers unions. They've got to make the, the naughty list before I, I turn it over to you. The leader, the president of the Chicago Teachers Union, we don't need to worry about her on the income front. She makes over $289,000 a year. But sadly, we do need to worry about her ability to pay her bills. Apparently, she's got three years of of bills unpaid for like water and garbage service over $5,000. So she got her fellow union brother, she literally called him union brother, Brandon Johnson elected as mayor and uh, with the promise that they were going to make the wealthy pay their fair share. But here she is wealthy, not paying her, her fair <laughs> chair. And all of that's kind of silly, I guess, that she's not paying her bills. And, you know, people, I guess, should be well compensated if they're doing good work. But the union controlled school system in Chicago is horrific when it comes to how, how students are treated and educated. 18% of Chicago students and only 8% of Black students were meeting math standards this year. 8% of Black students. And then chronic absenteeism, which is a problem nationwide, uh, is definitely a problem in Chicago. 40% of all students were chronically absent. Okay. So this uh, union leader is not paying her bills, and she's uh, not doing a great job overseeing education in her city. So the Chicago Teachers Union and uh, their president, what is her name, Stacy Davis Gates, definitely on the naughty list. Well, um, I think that they are rivaled only by the Baltimore public school system, which we learned had 23 schools with students who were not proficient at all in math. So zero proficiency, 23 schools, not one student took the state test and was able to do math at grade level. I mean, these are kids that are, they can't like count change at the grocery store if, if they're not yeah. meeting grade level. Um, and that, those were just the schools that had 0% proficiency. Um, you, you'll find that schools in Baltimore will have like only one or two kids in 20 other schools that are proficient in reading. So I don't know what these school districts are doing. However, Baltimore has a very high teacher union influence. Mm -hmm. And I think it's pretty obvious that the teachers union there is holding back kids because we can't fire teachers that aren't teaching kids how to read and basically count change. It's pretty scary that these kids are going to graduate into a world where they're going to be innumerate and illiterate. Um, right, right. Well, we definitely want to point the finger and lay the blame on the teachers unions, but we certainly haven't a lot of education bureaucrats or educrats who are uh, worthy of the, the naughty list. Did you have any uh, school districts that you wanted to put on the list? Oh, I have a lot. Oh, uh, where should I begin? Um, let's see. So let's just go to Rhode Island for a second because this this like blows my mind. So uh, we have Providence School District. Uh, really, you can kind of think of it as Detroit. It's that bad. And <clears throat> recently this year, they were fundraising for human smugglers. 
So in Providence, we had a emails reveal that that a counselor and a school principal were working together to raise funds to pay back me the Mexican cartel for smuggling a human student, a human student, sorry, a student over the border. And they were trying to pay back the Mexican cartel on this like emergency email saying, oh, we still need like 2000 more dollars or else this poor student is going to have his family killed. And so a teacher leaked those emails to a friend of mine, sent them to me. And then we broke the news that this was happening in Providence School District. We heard rumors that FBI was at the school. Uh, there was an investigation. But then, of course, in Rhode Island fashion, nothing was reported further. And the two educators resigned. There were no charges brought, even though this was in violation of federal and state laws to like have a conspiracy to undermine immigration laws. Um, but that's just a little... Uh, just a little taste of what goes on in Rhode Island public schools. These people get away with uh, <laughs> fundraising for human smugglers and all they do is lose their jobs and we never really hear about them again. So that's one school district behaving very badly. Um, other school districts behaving badly include the uh, Escondido Union School District in California, where we have teachers that are Christians suing because they refuse to lie about students' gender identity. And so they're claiming that their freedom of speech, their freedom to exercise their religion um, should give them a, a religious accommodation. And so if they see that a child is gender confused or they're in the GSA club, that they can't just deceive a parent. And so good for them. They brought a lawsuit saying that they should not have been fired because by the way, they were fired for refusing to deceive parents about gender quackery in their school district. Um, we hear a lot coming out of California, but this is happening all over the country. So for example, in Wisconsin, we have a lawsuit challenging the same gender policy saying that you can't keep secrets from parents. It was filed in 2021 and now it's on appeal. So that's, you know, very frustrating that these lawsuits take so long, but there's, um, you know, there's always an update as like some lawsuit from two years ago that, you know, they're not giving up the fight. And that lawsuit is with um, ADF Alliance Defending Freedom. They do a lot of religious freedom lawsuits. We have a district in Colorado. This is recent news. You probably heard of this. Jefferson County School District had an 11 year old girl forced to share a bed in a hotel room with a boy who identified as a girl. No one knew that this boy said he was transgendered. And it was only when this 11 year old girl got in the hotel room with him and he told her he was a boy. And then the girl went into the bathroom, panicked, hiding to call her dad and say, I I'm in a bed with a boy. Like, 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 what do I do? Luckily, the girl's mom was on the school field trip um, and she could go and help her. But I mean, this is part of these secret gender policies. You can read them. It's in my school district. It's probably in yours. Oh, it's definitely it's, mine. <laughs> yeah, where it says out. I mean, it explicitly says that we have to respect a student's gender identity when it comes to overnight field trips. So, I mean, I just can't believe that these school districts are are ready to subject themselves to the liability of sexual assault after. Like how many years of us making Title IX better? Because if you remember, we had college campuses that were under fire for mishandling Title IX complaints when it came to um, allegations of rape. It seemed like we had turned a corner and now we're just in this new circus where you can just say that you're a girl and you can be in bed. You're actually a boy in bed with with a girl at 11 years old. It's it's really terrifying. Right. Bathrooms have gotten a lot of attention over the years. And then more recently, women's sports. But we do need to be very clear that these gender support plans, as they're called, do make accommodations for, as you said, overnight trips. So this this permeates everything when it comes to the a child's education experience. And parents need to be on alert. Yeah. Um, another school district in Virginia, this is, I don't, I don't know if I'm saying this district right, Appomattox, mm -hmm. okay, Appomattox School District, um, the mother sued them for hiding the high school's gender, gender transition, gender confusion, and um, this case became very famous because the girl later ran away and then was sex trafficked. So you can see the effects that this has on kids. It's like, if you're hiding this from parents, parents are not able to protect their kids from even worse things happening to them. Um, 
Right. So school districts uh, across the nation, we certainly need to put most of them on the list, on the naughty list for student performance. Uh, but in addition to not doing their job and instructing students in math and reading, and certainly not addressing learning loss and egregious uh, problems that students are having um, as they try to recover from prolonged school closures, they're hiding information from parents and they're creating really unsafe environments and in particular uh, for girls. Let's talk about one more thing on the naughty list before we move on to the, the good news the nice list. And that is book quote unquote bans. Uh, we've addressed this topic multiple times throughout the year. You actually submitted congressional um, remarks for the congressional record uh, when they had a hearing on this topic. Um, who's on the naughty list specifically when it comes to this book quote unquote ban narrative? Well, the books that are on the naughty list include the famous Gender Queer, which has cartoon depictions of children engaging in sex acts. Of course, now the author, Maya Kubabe, later comes out, you know, two years later after it's in all these school districts across America saying, oh, I never meant for it to be in school districts. This was never meant to be for kids. Um, even though, you know, unions and, and schools are saying that, that we must have this book in school because it's going to save lives. Um, another book is called This Book is Gay. This book actually directs children to sex apps. Insane. And it gives children instructions on sex, on all forms of sex. It's like an Ikea manual on how to have sex. And these are kids in public school. This is tax funded materials. Uh, always with pictures, these books, <laughs> right? We're not talking about reading literature where you know the sex act might be happening. That's something that you and I did when we were in high school. Um, this isn't like reading a novel. This is like graphic novels and, and these uh, like very, very illustrated quote unquote books. Right. Yeah. And, and the argument that that people make to defend these pictures, which are clearly pornography, yeah. is they say, well, it wasn't the intent of the author to um, arouse the reader. And this is, you know, purely meant for for education. You know, it's and it's so lame because you think if you're drawing a picture of a sex act, it's it's going to have like, especially for a child who has little to no sexual experience, it's going to it's going to have a sexual effect on them. Like, it's just the yeah. human brain that that's what happens. So it's and they are children. They're not they're not adults. Let's be clear right. on the audience. Right. Yes. Yeah. And it's also going to traumatize them. There's yeah. so much evidence of, of the trauma of pornography. So it's very uh, just ridiculous that these schools who who tout trauma informed education will just deny the traumatic effect of pornography on children. Mm -hmm. All right. So uh, who's behind the narrative? Who should be on the naughty list? Who's behind the narrative around uh, parents raising questions about these books and, and then calling that a book ban? Oh, American Library Association, hand, hands down. So the American mm -hmm. Library Association is, is like the center of the cult of banned books. And, you know, every year they have banned books weeks. They, they create this big media campaign to talk about books that are banned. And really, there are no books that are banned. And when they say banned books, what they actually mean are books that are challenged by parents for being sexually explicit. And some of these books are just maybe moved from like the middle school area to the high school area, you know, and then they're going to say that just making that book uh, placed in a more appropriate, you know, setting, which I beg to differ that it's even appropriate for high school, they're going to label that book banned. So just challenging a book and saying, I don't think this should be in school. I don't think my taxes should pay for this. It's automatically labeled banned. And then we have the American Library Association's Office for Intellectual Freedom. So these are people that are supposed to be honest, say that um, they reframed sexually explicit material as diverse material. So that way they could fight back against parents and say, well, you're not really objecting to sexually explicit material. You just don't like diversity. You're just racist and bigoted. And they're on video saying that. And then when you cross-reference that with all of the pornography in school, it really uh, sort of just like pulls that curtain down and you can see how radical the American Library Association is. And, and actually my school district, they adopted a book banning resolution that they would not allow they would not allow book banning in school and they just plastered the American Library Association's, you know, anti-book banning pledge into my school district policies. Mind you, that's right next to the policy that explains to you how you can challenge a book. 
So I don't know how they're going to hold those two things, but uh, it, it's really just all propaganda that that is only meant to scare you from exercising your own right. Yeah, we'll be we'll be talking more about this narrative into next year, and I'm sure you and I would love to be talking about other things. I don't want to be talking about uh, faux book bans and and countering these these lies uh, days day after day. I, you know, I'd love to talk about like classical education and, and, you know, wonderful books that are out there that children can and should be reading. I'd, I'd love to talk about kind of anything else, but it's really important to kind of keep our eye on, on what's true and what's, what's not true. Okay. So I have a transition item as we transition from the naughty list to the nice list. And this is something that we covered in a recent uh, teachers union weekly report card. And that is, uh, let's see, for the naughty side of things, the Iowa state education association, uh, sued the state uh, because the state passed a law this year that encourages schools to provide students with age-appropriate materials. And the law states that age-appropriate does not include any material with descriptions or visual depictions of a sex act. So the teachers union band together with Penguin, Random House, and four authors, some of whom are, are well known, and sued the state because they really, really, really want to make sure that children have access to sexually explicit content. Uh, so, okay, so the Iowa teachers union on the naughty list. I'm going to put Iowa on, on the nice list for giving this a try on, on pushing back on this sexually explicit content that the unions and other Activists are so eager to push on children, but with the caveat that sometimes you got to tweak things a little bit when the language maybe doesn't quite work initially in the in the law. And I understand that there might be some concerns um, about a broad law that is defining age appropriate. Um, so the the goal of the law to make sure that children um, are provided with age appropriate materials. That definitely makes the nice list for me. And then always, you know, always with the caveat that like state legislatures meet regularly. If you don't like exactly how things are worded, maybe don't sue, maybe just like go like <laughs> work with your legislature and, and, uh, and, and tweak the law a little bit during the next legislative session. So, okay, so we're on to the nice list. Um, good job, Iowa, trying to address the sexually explicit content out there. Um, and a good job, Governor Kim Reynolds of Iowa, leading the way when it comes to education freedom legislative initiatives in 2023. Iowa kicked off a fantastic year for education freedom or school choice. And uh, Governor Reynolds was a true leader in making it very clear that she wanted a broad uh, universal school choice bill passed by the um, by her legislature and boom, she got it like kind of almost immediately. She had everything lined up and Iowa has um, a universal school choice bill. And soon after that, several other governors expressed what they wanted out of their legislative sessions and uh, when it came to school choice and they got it as well. And so three other governors to put on the nice list, Governor Sarah Huckabee Sanders of Arkansas, Governor um, uh, Kevin Stitt of, of Oklahoma. And then I want to go ahead and add Governor Greg Abbott of Texas, even though he uh, was not successful on the le legislative front, he certainly was a leader when it came and to showing commitment for expanding school choice. Unfortunately, there are a handful of Texas legislators that um, did not uh, did not agree that students should have expanded access to education opportunities. So governors that made the, the nice list, uh, congratulations. We are so thankful for you. Um, on that topic of uh, school choice and education freedom, I want to make sure we have a shout out to all the states that now have passed education savings accounts or created universal or near universal school choice. And uh before 2023, that was Arizona and, and West Virginia. This year, again, there was a cascade. There was Iowa and Arkansas, and then um, Utah were early out of the gate. And then Oklahoma passed a universal tax credit that is just now uh, being implemented. Florida expanded existing programs, so did Ohio, and so did North Carolina. So these are... Um, exciting developments when it comes to education freedom and um, to have states that where all K-12 students can access 
education opportunities besides their residentially assigned school, I think it's going to be such a positive development. Indiana, I should also put on the nice list, they now have a, a near universal program. 97% of the kids are um, eligible, and that's an expansion of their existing program. So this is this is monumental because we've been doing this for 30 years, and it's been very incremental and very um, small gains and limited populations that have been served by the programs. Uh, we understandably started in the school choice movement by prioritizing students who were low income and trapped in urban failing schools like those Baltimore schools that we mentioned earlier and the Chicago schools that we mentioned earlier. We've always wanted to prioritize those kids. And um, when there are universal programs, the states that are kind of doing this wisely are still making sure that they are prioritized um, in accessing these, these programs. We then expanded to students with disabilities because so frequently their needs are not met and even though they're federally guaranteed and those grew slowly over time and those students, um, even in universal states that are implementing this well are also going to continue to be prioritized. So there was incremental, incremental growth for certain uh, groups of students and now we see this e explosion of, of growth and um, and it's 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 going to be great uh, to have good news because we've had so much bad news <laughs> for the last few years with school closures and with the learning loss and with districts uh, just flushing their federal supplemental funding down the toilet um, rather than investing it in in these uh, students. Um, now these students can their parents can say, "All right, I'm done. I'm gonna I'm gonna leave." And for the school districts who um, haven't been listening to parents, if they start hearing from parents that they might leave, mm -hmm. then studies have shown that they start shaping up and they start responding to students' needs and to parents' needs. So that competitive effect is going to has historically and will wake up school districts of uh, parents who are and students who are still in the school districts are going to benefit as well. And I'm, I'm excited about that. OK, so those were um, my nice list when it comes to governors and states with education uh, freedom. I know we want to talk about the Given Name Act. Is there anything else that you would want to put on the on the nice list, Nicole? Oh God. I mean, school choice was probably just the nicest gift ever. This <laughs> you know, you know and anyone who is poo-pooing school choice, it almost doesn't matter because it is happening no matter what people right. criticize school choice over. And so that that is very much a relief. Okay. Um, I'm glad to hear you say that. And we'll loop back to school choice a little bit uh, later, but let's talk about the Given Name Act. And that relates to some stuff on the naughty list when school districts decide to hide uh, social transitions of children, start calling them by a different name, calling them by different pronouns. Uh, that is not a neutral act that pushes them down a one-way path to medical transition. And so uh, a new legislation introduced this year and passed in six states is, is the Given Name Act, which which says, nope, you need to ask for parents' permission before you change the child's name and start calling them by different uh, different pronouns. And that state, um, the states that, that are on the nice list for passing the Given Name Act are Arkansas, Florida, Kentucky, Iowa, uh, North Dakota, and Utah. And um, let's be clear, uh, these active interventions need to, need to stop and parents absolutely need to be in, involved and they have a right to refuse uh, intervention and refuse uh, social transition and to protect their child. So thank you states for passing the Given Name Act. We look forward to seeing more in the future. All right, as we wrap up, let's uh, quickly talk about what needs to happen in 2024. What, what do you hope happens, Nicole? Number one, defund the teachers union. They are the number one threat to American education and they need to be stripped of their money, power, and uh, membership. So we need to start having teachers leave the union. We need to start having more and more people criticize them. And um, it, it's, you know, even when we have school choice, the teachers union is still a threat. There are lots of, say, charter schools that can have teachers unions and we'll have the same problems there. Well, I mean, it still won't be as bad <laughs> as public school, but, you know, as, as long as you have the teachers union lurking in the corner, they're, they're still going to be there to undermine all of these leaps and bounds we've, we've made with education freedom. Right. And I know you are a huge academic transparency advocate. That's, I think, how yeah. I became aware of you in addition to your, to your lawsuit. So what do you hope will happen there? 
you know, uh, so my lawyers at the Goldwater Institute, they have a fabulous model policy called the academic transparency model policy. And what it says is that school districts have to post all of their curriculum, instructional materials, supplementary materials, teacher trainings. Um, all of that has to be posted online. So that way you can see exactly what your kids are learning in school. You may think that your child is just, you know, learning you know, some classic American literature, and then you find out that they've been learning it through, you know, like a Marxist lens the whole time. So really the book is just a vehicle to learn about Marxism and they're not actually learning any English literature. So that's all very important. So, so that way it's not just the curriculum and we see kind of like a list of what's going on. You have to see the actual materials, the handouts, the, you know, the, the Google um, resources that teachers are using. So we truly understand what kids are teaching in school. Yeah. Um, and let's let's be clear, like my my daughter goes to a Catholic high school and I have access to all of that information. It doesn't have to be a big fight, particularly yeah. if you have school choice and schools that are like, of course, you can see it. Of course, parents should be involved. But this legislation yeah. um, helps wake up the, the school districts that don't have that that mindset. Yeah. Uh, we talk a ton about Title IX. Uh, I don't uh, so much, but it seems like everybody else at IWF does. Thank goodness. Um, what are your thoughts on on Title IX coming up? Yeah. So, you know, there's so much confusion about what is going on with, with Title IX. We hear a lot of school districts say, oh, well, we, we have to keep secrets from parents when kids say that they're the opposite sex because it's it's federal law. You know, it's Title IX. And there's it's very misleading because, number one, there was a rule change proposed this year to incorporate gender identity into the definition of sex. And that rule change never happened. However, because the federal government is so good at propagandizing, they can just use presidential commentary. They can use uh, you know, health and human services propaganda through Rachel Levine to make some statement of like, oh, gender affirming care is essential health care. And Americans start hearing all of this gender cult dogma so that when they go to school and, they, and now their kid is being transed at school, they're led to believe that, oh, we have to do this because it's an effort to prevent discrimination of kids with gender dysphoria. And that's not true at all. So what I want to see is have the, the presidential campaign focused on Title IX because it's really Title IX and the, the, the confusion surrounding Title IX that's fueling all of this gender identity um, policies in school districts that are that are harming kids. And of course, the gender identity policies that are harming women's sports um, so I think Title IX is a really big deal and, and we really just need to focus on that and get the, the whole country like on board with what is exactly happening with that. Right. Yep. Please, listeners, pay attention to, yes. to Title IX. It's a big deal. And it's not just women's sports at the college level. It, it goes all the way through um, every aspect of education. All right, uh, Nicole, we started with your story and, and the lawsuit that you're involved with. Uh, final final recommendation for 2024, I believe, has to do with uh, lawsuits. Yes. Um, you know, it's great to be a parent that goes to school board meetings and you're making public comment. You're putting your neck out there. But if if you see that your school is breaking the law, you have to file lawsuits. Schools are incentivized to fight you. They, they There are people um, that are paid, the superintendents, the principals, the, the school board, they are paid to fight people who disagree with their agenda. So that's their job. The only way you're going to disincentivize them from fighting you when you disagree with their radical agendas is by filing a lawsuit. So um, I have parents that will contact me on Facebook, on Twitter. They're contacting other bigger organizations saying, you know, my, my kid was disciplined for misgendering. Well, you got to sue. You, you have to teach them a lesson that if they do this, you're going to take action. And then one lawsuit can set precedent for school districts across the country. And they're going to be put on notice when you win that, you know, you, you when you win that, like, you know, your kid can't be disciplined for telling the truth about biological reality. Now, all other schools are going to be disincentivized from disciplining your kid from doing that. And so, you know, not everyone has to sue, but we just need those brave parents that are willing to do it to just take that leap and do it. Right. And students whose uh, parents who have students with special needs who uh, aren't being served well by the school district, they can serve they can sue um, and uh, receive access to a private school 
education paid for by the school district. So for those of you who live in states who didn't make the nice list, who don't have school choice programs yet, the lawsuits are a way to receive an education option for your child with special needs. They're an expensive way. I'd rather you have um, options to programs. But um, yeah, those lawsuits are are out there for, for multiple reasons. Uh, final, final thing that I want to say in 2024, let's just see more expansions of education freedom. And um, let's get all the conservatives on board for education freedom. Sometimes there's some misconceptions about school choice. So our final question at Student Server Systems is always, what is the school choice myth that you'd like to dispel today? And uh, Nicole, I'll turn that over to you to answer. There is a myth that school choice is some kind of Trojan horse for more woke indoctrination or for the government to get their clutches into, you know, not just public education, but private schools and um, all other, you know, homeschooling. And, and that is a myth because woke ideology did not come into public schools because of school choice. Woke, I, you know, it, it's already here. Woke ideology and radical politics are in school because of the people that are in public school, the individuals that have their own personal beliefs, they then bring it into public school. If you can leave public school and go to a charter school or a private school, or you can homeschool, um, and you find that woke indoctrination is now happening in your new school, well, guess what? You can leave again. Now you have school choice. You can find a school that isn't doing it. And so it's a market force. Now, School choice isn't like an, an, an insulator from woke indoctrination coming into your school because you can have a charter school or a private school that wants to be totally woke and crazy. And, and that's their prerogative, maybe depending on you know what they're doing, but you can still leave. So it's not the mechanism by which radical politics and um, uh, woke indoctrination comes into school. And uh, there's just a lot of fear mongering that if we have school choice, then there will be strings attached to government money. But all you have to do is put a provision in the school choice bill that says, I mean, no strings attached, right? It says that just because a Catholic school is going to accept a school choice voucher doesn't mean that that Catholic school now has to teach gender ideology as part of their curriculum. Um, so it's really easily debunked. And I think people, they're just so scared that that like something like this is definitely going to happen that they kind of want to protect their own little school world, whether it be homeschooling or their their religious school that is so far inoculated and they're afraid that any change is is dangerous when really this is not something that is realistically going to happen. All right, Nicole, thanks for... Uh, tackling the school choice myth. That's the last one of the year. And we've been doing this all year. I encourage people to listen to all, I believe it's 25 episodes of, of Students Over Systems. We tackle myths at the end of every, every episode. Um, thank you for all that you're doing. I love working with you. I wish you the best in your lawsuit next year. And thanks for joining us today. Thank you, Jenny. We hope listeners found today's conversation informative and encouraging. If you enjoyed this episode of Students Over Systems, please consider leaving a review on your favorite podcast app. And don't forget to share this episode with your friends. To learn more about the work of the IWF Education Freedom Center, please visit iwf.org EFC. Thank you for listening to Students Over Systems. Until next time, until next year, keep celebrating education freedom and brighter futures.